Mr. Godwich, it's such a pleasure chatting with you in this Independence Day special. And over the next 30 minutes, we hope to construct a short-term, a medium-term, and a long-term outlook to put India on the high-growth path. I want to start with the near term because there are a few quick fixes that you've yourself uh, pointed out over the years. Uh, GST, the biggest of them all. I can't think of another corporate leader who has campaigned vociferously for GST than you. Must be disappointing to see it fall prey to political legislative logjam. Yes, it's unfortunate that politics is taking precedence over economics in our country. Mm -hmm. And this is, not, of course, not the first time. It has been, happened in the past also. But I do hope they will call another session of parliament soon and try and pass the GST. The finance minister has announced that he would like to implement it by the 1st of April 2016. I think it will make a huge difference if it is done. I expect the GST... Once implemented, we'll add two percentage points to our GDP growth and perhaps put us on a path of double-digit economic growth for several years. Yeah. I want to have a more detailed conversation on GST, but before that, you were one of the few corporate leaders who even signed a petition urging our lawmakers to you know, get down to business, set aside political differences. What you know, prompted you to do that? Well, because I think I, I, it, was, it was sad to see that uh, a four-week parliament session uh, went almost without any work being conducted. Uh, that's not how parliaments run. That's not how they should run. And it was sad to see what happened. We've always had a bit of a problem in our parliamentary functioning, but this was about the worst I've seen. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's a stronger need for, you know, issues of national interest, issues of strategic economic interest, that there should be no bipartisan political agenda? Because especially in GST, it was, uh, in a sense, pushed forward by the previous government and, and the other ones were, st were you know, stifling it today. Do you think there should be a bipartisan agenda, so to say? I think as far as uh, le legislatures go, I think political parties should make it a point that politics should not come in the way of governance, in the way of economic development, in the way of people benefiting. And I think some such understanding uh, could be very useful to the long term. Mm -hmm. You did talk about the special session and that is being uh, talked about. You understand the architecture of GST as well. Given the kind of time frame that we are now looking at, even if there was to be a special session end of this month, are you hopeful we can meet the April 1, 2016 deadline? Yes, because most of the work has already been done. Very little work needs to be done. There's not much preparation that is really required. All the software work was done by uh, the earlier team. So I don't see much difficulty in implementing, even if it gets passed by September end. Right. You know, you again pointed to the 2% markup that we can get to our GDP. But, you know, while corporate India understands the benefits of GST, probably one feels that the man on the street still doesn't realize uh, the game-changing nature of, of GST, and which is why, while India Inc. is up in arms over the delay in passing this legislation, the pain hasn't quite been, you know, percolated down to, to the common man on the street. From a broader economy at large, how game-changing is GST? Well, uh, it is a game-changer. It, it, will, uh, it will make uh, uh, logistics, it will make doing business in India much easier. It will add a lot of value to growth, it will cut prices. Evasion of taxes will become difficult. So clearly it's a game changer. And unfortunately, it's, you can't expect the common man to understand these economic details and what effect uh, this sort of uh, uh, reform can have on the economy. Mm -hmm. One of the fine prints of GST, which has also led to a fair amount of debate, is on the 1% additional tax and the possible cascading effect that it may have. Uh, uh, what's your view on how limiting is this? See, there are several uh, factors which uh, do not make this GST law a perfect GST. And in order to get everybody on board, they had to make a few compromises to get uh, everybody on board. So some items are out of the GST. Uh, of course, alcohol, um, cigarettes, and petroleum, petroleum products. Now, petroleum products is not a good thing to keep out because it's a major input into manufacturing. This 1% levy for two years is also something that is uh, uh, out of the ordinary. There are several such points. But if a perfect GST were, say, to add 100 points of value to the economy, I would say this one will add 80 points. So it's much better to go through with it, get it 
done and then amend it suitably as time goes by so that in a couple of years we could have a perfect GST. So you wouldn't call this a half-big GST? It may be an no, I wouldn't call it a half big, half big. But I, I think all, all laws, if you look at when we change from state sales tax to VAT, also some compromises were made. In fact, some states did not join in the beginning. And when they saw the other states' revenues going up so much, they quickly came on board. Came on board. So I feel uh, this will be the same. The other bone of contention is the rate, which obviously hasn't been decided, and the GST council will, but there is a lot of political uh, pressure that's going to go into go that figure as well. Is it critical that the rate stands competitive? Because if, if it's going to be 27, 26%, as there have been some rumors, uh, again, it could make it a bit of a non-starter from industry's point of view. Yeah, the rate, I mean, 26, 27% would be absurdly high. I expect the rate will be around 20, 21%, but even if the rate were about 18, 19%, I think our revenues would go up. And as the GST is implemented, we could even bring down the rates and still collect the same revenue. Because evading taxes will become extremely difficult. And if evasion of indirect taxes is curtailed, evasion of direct taxes will also come down. Sure. The other quick fix, Mr. Godrej, is the interest rate regime. And again, you've been uh, vociferously uh, you know, uh, batting for a slightly more accommodative monetary stance. Given where inflation is now at 3.8%, uh, consumer price inflation, which is what the RBI looks at, do you believe now there is a strong case for a sharp rate cut? Yeah, extremely strong case, especially with today's WPI, WPI figures well. coming in at minus 4%. I think uh, the real interest rates in India are very, very high. I think it's, I hope the RBI decides to bring the rates down out of turn, not wait till the September mon monetary policy. I think it's very important because the real interest rates in India for businesses are far too high. In your sense, how much elbow room is there for a, for a rate cut through the course of this financial year? Because people are talking about quarter of a percent, maybe half a percent at most. What's your sense? No, I think it can be much more because I feel the monsoon is also panning out reasonably well. I think commodity prices globally, because of the Chinese have slowdown, have come down dramatically. That is having its effect in India. Agri prices are also low. Global agri prices are also low. So I feel Indian inflation will be very well contained. So I think uh, before March 2016, a couple of percentage points of interest rate cuts can be expected. I hope the RBI governor is listening, but uh, do you also feel that the window is limited because again one expects the Fed to hike rates later this year or maybe early next year and that could lead to some amount of volatility. So in a sense, the window is limited and the central bank needs to act now? To a certain extent, but even the Fed might postpone its the interest rate, rate hike because of the Chinese uh, decision. So we have to wait and watch, but I think overall uh, rates should come down in India. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been speaking to a lot of corporates. The other immediate concern right now, Mr. Godrej, is China's move to devalue its currency. Um, as a, uh, you know, uh, the way from your vantage point, how much of a concern is that for India in general and for Indian exporters in particular? Well, uh, certainly uh, China, China is a large economy, it's the second largest economy in the world. Uh, but we must remember that they, they have devalued the currency after a while. Many other currencies have devalued to the dollar quite a lot, including the Japanese yen. So they, it's a, just a catching up for the Chinese. I don't think it will have much of an uh, effect uh, on the Indian economy. The Indian rupee has also devalued a little to the dollar after the Chinese devaluation. So I don't think it will have much of an effect. And if we can get our reform process going, I think we'll be very competitive. You, but fundamentally, at the core, what everyone's concerned is about is the competitiveness of our ma of our manufacturing sector, of our industry uh, in general. Uh, is this not going to hurt the competitiveness, especially at a time when we still have a question mark on GST? No, I think uh, the Indian rupee is uh, is being freely traded, so it'll it'll find its level uh, as it has in the last couple of days. So I don't think that will affect our exports. <laughs> Uh, interest rates could be one of the reasons, Mr. Godesh, but what's puzzling for a lot of us is the reason why the investment cycle hasn't turned. You know, it's been 18 months of a government that's widely believed to be pro-reform, pro-market, uh, so to say, and yet the, uh, the investment cycle hasn't turned. What, according to you, is the reason for that? Uh, there are a couple of reasons. One is that Indian industry has found ways of being more productive over the last two or three years. 
So in the same plant, with small investments, productivity has improved considerably. So without new investments, uh, more production is coming out of Indian factories. That is one of the reasons why the Indian GDP growth, after going on a value-added basis, has been stated at a higher level than the earlier just numerical count GDP growth we used to publish. Uh, secondly, uh, I think the general consumer demand has not picked up as much as it should have by now. The growth in GDP is mainly in the services sector. And now I expect this growth will translate into the uh, industrial sector also. So new investments will come in. If the GST comes in, then clearly demand will grow tremendously and new investments, to my mind, will follow very soon. And you don't think interest rates is a stumbling block or is that one of the reasons? It is. It's one of the reasons, certainly. Mm -hmm. Certainly one of the reasons, but only one of the reasons. Let's face it, it's not the only reason. Sure. Uh, let's talk about manufacturing revival because I know from your medium-term outlook point of view, you believe that manufacturing is what's going to revive growth and, uh, and the government has laid out a broad policy architecture in terms of making India uh, as, a, as a campaign. Uh, but are you happy with the kind of fine print that there is to this program, the kind of enabling environment that there is to this ambitious Make in India initiative that was incidentally launched by the Prime Minister just last year on Independence Day? Yes. Uh, ease of doing business is very important for making India and manufacturing growth to be successful. Now, the government is doing quite a lot to improve the ease of doing business, but to my mind, more needs to be done, especially in certain areas where the government acts. For example, this Nestle uh, issue has created a lot of waves among foreign investors. If you look at some of the tax decisions, we had decided that we will give up retrospective taxes, but it's not been totally done away with. So many of these things need to be eased upon in order to uh, uh, project an image of ease of doing business in the country. Mm -hmm. But specifically with manufacturing, uh, Mr. Godrej, two key components, land and labor, right? Uh, on land, we saw the government make a bold move by trying to amend the, uh, what was a non-starter of a land acquisition bill that the previous government had floated. And now we understand that they're trying to go back on it because it's being seen as anti-poor. Uh, is that a big letdown from industry's point of view? To a certain extent. Uh, I think the government amendments uh, made a lot of sense. But now, of course, there are other things you can use in the original act which allow the states to have their own policy and some of the states are doing that. Many of the states already have some land banks which can be used for industrialization. So I don't think it will be as serious a problem. As far as labor reforms go, yes, some labor reforms will certainly help and it will increase employment in the country because these labor reforms would add to ease of manufacturing would add to investments in manufacturing and in fact lead to additional employment, not the other way around. So I do hope both will come about. You know, you explained in some detail why Indian businesses aren't increasing investments, but from a foreign investment point of view, we've seen one grand announcement with Foxconn just a few, uh, just a week or so ago. But other than that, nothing uh, more has come through. Uh, what is what is that due to? Do you believe it's because of this environment that needs to be fixed in terms of taxation regime, ease of doing business, or is it uh, also because the government hasn't reached out enough? What explains that? No, but FDI has been increasing. FDI growth has been quite good, but it can be much more if some of these perceptions were to be further improved. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we spoke about land, uh, Mr. Godrej, and you know, at the core, this whole issue has unfortunately turned out into whether it's pro-poor or anti-poor and how it's going to hurt the farmer and how it's going to be, uh, you know, bad for the agriculture sector. The whole narrative has, uh, and, you know, the opposition has managed to successfully change the narrative. Uh, but do you believe fundamentally the agriculture sector in itself needs to go through a bit of a reset? Uh, what's your outlook on that? Well, the agricultural sector certainly needs to improve its productivity. And there's a lot of technology coming through uh, which can do that. So, for example, irrigation, things like drip irrigation could help a lot. Uh, uh, s better seeds could help a lot. You know the statistic in India that if we can get the same productivity 
on all major crops throughout India that we that is equal to the best in India, I'm not even talking of the best globally, we could double our agricultural output. So it's a question of just managing well, ensuring farmers get the inputs uh, that would allow them to do so. In some states like Gujarat, Madhya Pradesh, we've had double digit agri growth in the past. And I think if properly managed, this can enable strong agricultural growth and therefore benefit to the rural world. You don't think this band-aid approach of you know, a sharp hike in MSP like we've seen in the past few years is necessarily going to help uh, farmers? No, I think one should be careful because it also leads to inflation, inflation. and it creates many other complications which ultimately uh, take away the benefits of uh, better prices. Right. Uh, in terms of uh, getting people away from agriculture, that's also as, 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 a, you know, as a country develops, as there's more industrialization, you obviously see a shift away from agriculture as well. How does one manage that transition as we move towards becoming a more developing or uh, developed nation? Well, all, all uh, nations as they develop go through that transition. Urbanization has to take place. You cannot, you cannot develop strongly, you cannot become a developed nation if a large percentage of your population is in rural areas. So you have to urbanize and the, our, our several plans announced by the Prime Minister on improved urbanization, smart cities, uh, housing for all, etc. should be extremely helpful there. And we must go out of our way to see that urbanization goes up, that more and more people migrate to cities. Earlier, because we couldn't develop cities well, we were in fact trying to avoid migration to cities. But I think that is absolutely necessary to become a developed economy. You've just prompted me to my next session, which is all these initiatives that the government has announced, you know, whether it's housing for all, smart cities, which I know you're very uh, bullish on as well. Which one of these do you believe is going to be uh, the big game changer from a medium term? I point? think uh, India is such a large economy. That you need all of them. And we need all of them. And we should be very clear also we need growth in all our sectors. We can't say just manufacturing. It should be manufacturing, services, and, and agriculture. agriculture. We need to grow in all three. We need to have a strong emphasis on all three. And we need to have a strong emphasis on all the plans the uh, Prime Minister and the government have announced in order to take it forward. And we may have to announce a couple of new plans to add to the benefits. So, so you don't think it's a great idea to set a target that manufacturing should be 25% of the GDP? Let all sectors grow and find their... Uh, no, it's a good target which has already been set and it's a good thing to try and raise manufacturing salience to the GDP to 25%. But that should be done with very high growth in manufacturing and not by slowing down services or agricultural growth. Mm -hmm. But, you know, uh, one criticism that one often hears a lot with this government is while, while the vision may be there, execution is still not there. Would you give them slightly more time to get the uh, policy, you know, environment in place for executing these schemes, Digital India, Make in India, all of them? I think they've, uh, they've done very well in, in uh, announcing their vision, in uh, even spreading their vision around. I think execution is very important. And uh, I think a lot more can also be done without parliament by executive action in terms of taking a reform decision. So all of this together can help. Right. You spoke about the, key, the three key sectors. I want to understand the institutional framework because that's also important. Last year, I remember in the Independence Day speeches when the Prime Minister made it clear that he wants to scrap the Planning Commission and, you know, and, and form this new institution, Niti Aayog. Uh, it's still finding its feet. Uh, but, but what more needs to be done from an institutional framework uh, point of view to, to enable more stronger growth or double-digit growth over the next couple of... Uh, well, I think government should clearly decide to take less case-by-case -case decisions. Leave it to the market economy to take these decisions. If that is done well, I think things will go much better. I think it will also lead to much less corruption. It will lead to better governance. And clearly, it can lead to much faster growth. So you think we should empower regulators, create more sectoral regulators, keep them away from political yes, influence? Yes, and even, even just regulate less. There are certain sectors where you absolutely have to have regulator because you need to coordinate. There are many other sectors which don't need regulation. And I think uh, we should uh, have a laissez-faire uh, uh, sort of approach 
to these sectors. In fact, the Prime Minister himself has been saying for a while time, minimum government, maximum governance. But, right. but how tough is it to achieve this kind of a vision in a complicated economy like ours? It is, because we have been a controlled economy for so long that it's not very easy. But very clearly, we should have a path to move towards that objective. One step towards that is also privatization. We saw the previous NDA government take some bold decisions when it came to privatization and the industry was very welcoming of that. Uh, not enough movement on that front right now. Is that is that something that the government should consider? Yeah, I'm a little disappointed that this government, of course, is clearly putting strong emphasis on disinvestment, mm -hmm. but not any in emphasis on privatization. I think there should be some emphasis on privatization too. Right. You know, Mr. Godrej, uh, we, we've kind of constructed the short term quick fixes. We've looked at the medium term. Let's not talk about the long term, you know, 10 year, 20 year horizon. If you know, from your point of view, what do you think that we need to do to get the economy on a, on a fast growth path, the kind of, you know, uh, growth that say China saw uh, over a sustained period of time? What, what needs to be done from a long term point of view? I'm very convinced that if we bring in GST and a few other reforms, but mainly the GST, we can grow at double-digit growth rates for 10 years. <coughs> GST alone you think will lead to double-digit? GST digit? and some other, other reforms, reforms. Okay. but mainly GST. I also feel that by 2050, India will become the largest economy in the world by purchasing power parity. China is slowing down. I think we are, by purchasing power parity, the third largest economy in the world today. The US and China are ahead of us, and we are slightly ahead of Japan. Now, if we can get our reform process right, mainly because of our demographic advantage, between 2030 and 2040, we can overtake the United States in GDP growth based on purchasing power parity. Mm -hmm. Before that, China would have overtaken the US. And between 2030, uh, 2040 and 2050, we can overtake China. Our demography is excellent. Our growth potential is very strong. The young in India are very passionate about the country and about its growth. I think this is a great opportunity. I hope we seize it. Yeah, the other strength, of course, is that we are a democracy. But in many ways, is that also, um, you know, now stifling some of our uh, uh, game-changing, uh, you know, uh, aspirations. Like, for example, what we're seeing right now, uh, the fact that there needs to be a broad political consensus to achieve the kind of vision that you've laid out, there needs to be a broad political consensus. Do you see that in the political stream? But I think in the long run, our being a demo democratic country rather than an autocratic country will be helpful. Sure. I think we are seeing that coming up in China. Their autocracy is not helping. In the past it did. It's not helping them anymore. So I think this is a great time for India. It's India's decades coming up and I do hope we grab the opportunity. So according to you, closing comments from you Mr. Godrej, what is the most important factor that needs to be in place for us to get to this 2050 vision of yours of you know overtaking US and China in terms of purchasing power parity? What is the single most important factor that will get us there? I think we should concentrate on good governance. We should improve ease of doing business. We should have a friendly tax policy. The tax department should look at taxpayers as their consumers, as a company would look at its consumers. That's the best way to get it done, instead of having an adversarial relationship. And I think ease of doing business, if improved, can add tremendous value. So you're talking about a mindset change in the way governance happens, even not just at a political level, but even at the level of bureaucracy, the level of, say, tax department. That's critical. Yeah, everywhere. All right. Mr. Godri, it's such a pleasure chatting with you uh, and uh, getting your vision of India over the short term, medium term, and long term. Thank Very you so much for the interview. Thank, Thank you so much. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash etnow and don't forget to click the like button. You can also follow us on Twitter at etnowlive. To stay updated with all our programming, hit the subscribe button on our YouTube channel by logging on to youtube.com slash user slash etnow.